When the storm raged above them, the disciples were afraid. For the waves were high and the ship was tossed, they could not find their way. Then they awoke the master, saying, Lord, please save us now. He rebuked the wind and the sea grew calm. They all wondered how. God sees the storm from the other side. He knows the lessons learned. And just beyond the clouds, he sees clear skies. He speaks peace to the raging storm. Scott for taping this again today, recording this. You all know good and well that Scott or somebody's doing it because you know I'm not. I have to, Scott's here with me, I gotta relate this that my friend, one of my friends sent an email to me and said, welcome to the who says you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Welcome to the 21st century. I sent him a note back and said, yeah, well, the guys in our church that know how to do computer stuff have to still remind me not to put white out on my computer screen. So y'all in the church family know what I'm talking about.
Turn to Matthew chapter 21 if you have a Bible. We're going to look at the offer of Israel's king. And before we begin, there's something else I, I need to pass on to the church folk. Because I've, I've been asked what, what we ought to be doing with, with our giving. For those who wish to do so, if, if you're wanting to send it on, send it to box 236 to Fairmount. That's the church's box number. Or Ashley said that you can send it directly to her. And Ashley Lyons' box number is 144. So just wanted to pass that on to everybody. Matthew chapter 21, let's have some prayer before we look at scripture. Father, we have your word open before us. We have your spirit to teach us. We have our Lord Jesus whom we want to honor. We pray you make this time to be profitable in hearts today Lord if you see fit to use something that's been prepared in this message let us give you thanks for it if you see fit to use something that your spirit is doing as he works in individual hearts let the thanks be to you for Christ's sake Amen We can read through the prophets and they speak of a time when Israel's Messiah King will rule over them victoriously, gloriously from Jerusalem. And when Jesus presents himself on, on this occasion, which we call Palm Sunday, it was entirely legitimate. What we know is that the prophets also talk about how that Christ would suffer and die. And we know that that's going to be the outcome as we look in Scripture. But we want to take up this portion and see what, what took place simply because it's in the Scripture record. The first thing that we see here in verse 1 as it pertains to the office, offer of Israel's king is the place of the offer. It says, when, And when they drew near to Jerusalem and were come unto Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and straightway you'll find an ass tied and a colt with her, Loose them and bring them to me. Over in the book of, if you all want to turn, in the book of First Chronicles, chapter 11. First Chronicles, chapter 11, verses 4 and 5, it says, And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, were, the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, You'll not come here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, which is the city of David. We know that this is the place called Jerusalem. In Psalm 48, in verse 2, it says, Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king. This is Jerusalem. This is the place where this offer was being made, a city special to God. If we look in the prophet Zechariah chapter 14, as it relates to the Mount of Olives, it's at that place that there is going to be the, will be the origin of, of Jesus beginning a campaign that will lead to a great victory someday when he rules his kingdom for a thousand years. 
But notice something else here. They came to Bethphage under the Mount of Olives that at this little location, and this is this is small because it's located near the town of Bethany, which is in the in the region of Jerusalem. Not much significance. But notice it's the place where the presentation of Jesus Christ was going to begin. There's something to Amongst other things, there's something to see from noticing this. Not focusing our attention on Jerusalem or Mount of Olives. There's plenty to be said there. But Bethphage, we never know when there's going to be an opportunity to present Christ to the people. If these disciples had an awareness of what was going to be taking place I would think that they would suspect that it would happen in Jerusalem or it might be something very monumental taking place up on the Mount of Olives but not Beth again we simply have got to live our lives in such a way that we're always in a position we're always ready in our hearts to present Christ to people and every one of us could give accounts of times where it's been in an unusual situation. But think over in the book of Acts. In chapter 8, Philip goes to an entire city of Samaria and preaches Christ and, and sees great things happen for the Lord's sake. And then by the time we read very much further in Acts chapter 8, Philip's being taken out, in, he's taken out into the desert, and he comes into contact with a single man, Ethiopian eunuch. Paul tells Timothy, be instant, in season and out of season. The next point we want to see here is the person who was offered. In verse 1, we see it's Jesus sending his disciples to this task that he has for them. In verse 5, he's commissioning them toward this prophecy of Zechariah. Verse 5, tell you the daughter of Zion, behold, your king comes. Here's the person who's being offered, Jesus, the king. This prophetic statement that we have in Matthew 21 and verse 5 is found over in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. And of course, as is often the case, Zechariah has been speaking to the people of issues which pertain to him, but coming around to the point of, look, there's hope. And the hope rests in this one who's going to come to you. But remember... Matthew records for us back in chapter 2 of Matthew in verse 2 when the wise men came at the birth of Jesus and they said, where is he who is born king of the Jews? An interesting portion to examine is found over in Genesis chapter 49 verse 10 when Jacob is making some prophetic blessings upon his sons. He says in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall be the gathering of the people, binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. This was the this was this was the uh, prophecy that Jacob had for his sons. Now in that day, our Lord is presenting Himself to His people. Now. 
in this age and time, of course, we know this is true. One of the things that we try to wrap our thoughts around is the fact that Jesus is that king that was promised, but he is also the one who was going to have to suffer on behalf of his people. And y'all, we can thank the Lord that he suffered, that he was crucified, because in that, salvation is offered to Gentiles. We can surely praise the Lord for that. Fact is, I'm, I'm going back to the book of Galatians, chapter 3. It says in verse 7, Know therefore that they who are of faith, the same are the sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles through faith, preached before the gospel to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. So then, they who are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Skipping down to Galatians chapter 3 to verse 13. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now I've got another P. The procedure. We see the place that Israel's king was offered. We see the person who's offered. We see the procedure which is going to be followed in the offer of Israel's king. First of all, the disciples are sent. Verse 1 tells us that. Then sent Jesus to disciples. They went in pairs because it was important for them to travel this way to give protection and care for one another. It was, it was commonly known that traveling in many, in many locations throughout Israel could be a hazardous thing to do simply because there were bandits around and so forth. Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan. So people would travel in groups, actually, to give protection to one another. And it was the, it, it would be the government people or it would be wealthy people who would actually hire someone to provide protection, but always that protection. Now, that's not so much the point to see is to observe the fact that the disciples were necessary human instruments in presenting the Lord Jesus. And I say necessary not because it couldn't have been done otherwise, but because they had a great responsibility thrust upon them in what they're going to endeavor to do in presenting Jesus to his people. When the Lord was born, there was a star that appeared in heaven and it directed the wise men who came much later after the birth of Christ. There was the angel and the heavenly host. So God's able to do this kind of thing, but notice here the human instrumentality that's involved in seeing that Jesus Christ is being presented to the people. Think about it for ourselves. In this day and time, we don't have new prophecies. We aren't receiving new revelation, y'all. Right here in the Bible is all the revelation we've got from God and there isn't going to be any more. And yet, entrusted to us, is the message about Jesus Christ. God uses those who know Christ as Savior to present the message about him. I read something somewhere one time that President Grant made this comment, that Christ 
does not need great men, but great men do need Christ. Well, people need Christ as Savior, and perhaps somebody's listening to this message right now, and you don't know Christ as Savior, and you know you don't. Jesus Christ died to pay for your sin and, and if you will admit your sin to God and come to him by faith, you can be saved. You can have the hope of eternal life and it's not a hope that's maybe, it's a hope that's real. Coming back to our text, a second thing, the disciples were instructed. Now it says in verse 2 that Jesus said to them, Go to the village opposite you, and straightway you'll find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. This donkey. Now we see some things, that, a couple things anyway, about the obedience of the disciples. First of all, they didn't know all the details. Just about everybody was going to own a donkey an animal to, to be used in, in this respect but Jesus says just go into the village and, you, and you're going to find this one well which one? they're puzzling over this but it's no problem the disciples went the Lord was going to take care of everything else and y'all, honestly and truly, that is, that is the essence of the obedience that we exhibit when we walk by faith. And that is just to do what God says because God says it. Think of what Solomon wrote, writes in, a, in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, which a lot of us can quote. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. That begins with trusting the Lord that what he's going to do is going to be the best thing for us and not depend on trying to, to figure out a gimmick or something like that. But whatever is in front of me that has to be done, I make my choice according to what God teaches in Scripture and I leave the rest alone. God lays out the path. I need to make the decisions according to Scripture. These disciples didn't, didn't know where it was they were going to find this animal or which particular one it was going to be. They were just told to go, so they did. Another thing that we can view that was happening within the instruction given to the disciples is to see the humbleness displayed, exhibited, that's going to be associated with our Lord Jesus. Verse 2 talks about the ass tied, the colt with her, loose them and bring them to me, this donkey. In verse 5, it's, it's happening because the prophet Zechariah has quoted this. And Jesus is going to ride into Jerusalem and present himself as their king. And it was common that a, a king, somebody who had notoriety, and especially somebody who was claiming victory, it was common that they would be riding a very spirited acting white stallion. And here's the creator of the universe about to present himself to his people. These disciples have seen him walk on water. They've seen him still a raging storm out in the middle of the sea just by speaking a word. They've seen him raise dead people. They've seen him cast out demons. They know what he can do. And he's going to ride a donkey into his people. It's very fitting that, it, that it's reflective of the character of our Lord Jesus. 
And I'm going back to Matthew chapter 11, if, you, if you'll turn there. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. The Lord says, Come unto me, all you that labor and you're heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you'll find rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In this day and time, in this age in which we live, we are to be reflecting the heart of our Lord Jesus, a humble heart, a meek conduct. Humility comes from the heart. Meekness is the outer expression of it, the conduct of life. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, Like manner, you younger, submit yourselves to the older. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. The next point in this instruction we see particularly in verse 3, and it was that they were to tell that the Lord had need. If any man say anything unto you, you'll say the Lord has need of them. Talking about these animals. And straightway he will send them. You see, our Lord Jesus was not living this life here on earth did he live to be consumed by being caught up with things of this life. Back in Matthew chapter 8, if you want to turn there, and y'all, I do miss hearing the pages turn. I think I said that last week, but <laughs> I do miss that. Matthew chapter 8, verse 18. Now, when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart to the other side. And a certain scribe came and said to him, Master, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. And this was simply because our Lord wasn't consumed with things. Paul writes, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, how that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. Now, third point in the procedure of things that we're going to view here has to do with the obedience of the disciples. After Jesus says, go do this, and it tells us in verses 4 and 5 that this was done according to what the prophet said. It says in verses 6 and 7, the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them and brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes and they set them thereon. It was obedience to an opportunity. Our Lord has power to proclaim his own worthiness. Back in Matthew chapter 21, verses 15 and 16, earlier in this chapter, when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, the children crying in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were displeased and said to him, Do you hear what these people are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you perfected praise? Look over at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verses 39 and 40. Some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said to him, Master, rebuke your disciples. 
He answered and said, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. These disciples were obeying in an opportunity to proclaim the Lord Jesus. We're not forgetful that the Lord has the power to construct praise to, his, to himself. But we want to follow the example of these disciples and take opportunities, being bold to seize opportunities. There's something I read, and once again, I don't remember where I came by this, but it's a poem about the water mill. Listen to the water mill through the live long day, how the clicking of its wheel wears the hours away. In a proverb, haunts my mind as a spell is cast. The mill doesn't grind with the water that is past. Just about every one of us at some time or another and probably more than we like to admit have had times where we've really been upset with ourselves because we did not take an opportunity to present Christ to people. Or we walked away from a situation thinking, I should have said this, I should have done that. We can't go back and do those over. But what we can do is take the opportunities that present themselves to us right now. And yes, we're in a time where people aren't moving around very much. People aren't coming in contact with one another on a great scale. We're aware of that. <clears throat> but y'all, there are still going to be opportunities to present Christ, to encourage fellow Christians in some measure or another. And we want to seize those opportunities. Now, back in this text, verse 3 they, the disciples were told that, that somebody may say something to you and you're to say the Lord would have need. Straightway, they will send them. Here they were going to, they were going to find somebody who was going to be receptive. That's, that's always encouraging. But look back, look back at chapter 20, verse 17. Excuse me. Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside along the way and said to them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. He was going to face opposition and the disciples would be observing this. And of course, we know that Peter would deny the Lord Jesus. It's very encouraging when we have somebody exhibit a receptive attitude toward living for Christ, taking our position on things of the Bible, presenting their need to be saved. But very, very often, the opposition and rejection to Jesus Christ and holy living and, and seeking to uphold the truths of Scripture can be very discouraging in dealing with them. Rather than be discouraged, we need to be thankful. We need to praise the Lord for grace that we can keep on keeping on. And by the way, y'all, let's not forget to be thankful for one another in encouraging us. Uh, right now, there is an audience of one as I'm preaching this. And Scott, it's encouraging. But remember Hebrews chapter 12, 1, and I know that Zach has this for his running verses. Seeing that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. 
let us run with patience the race set before us. But notice how the Hebrews 12, 1 begins by saying, look at those who are around us and those who have gone before us. Being encouraged in this way. Now we've seen the place of the offer, the person who was offered, the procedure that was followed in making the offer. We see the prophecy. And this is verses 4 and 5. Jesus had instructed the disciples and said all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying tell the daughter of Zion behold your king comes to you meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt the foal of an ass. And remember again and probably a lot of us have cross references in our Bibles but for those who don't Put it in your Bible margin, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. This is where the prophet Ze Zechariah speaks of this. Now, this was going to be an intense scene because as we read a couple verses later that when Jesus comes into Jerusalem, everybody is just it is in a frenzy to welcome him in. But there wasn't a change of heart and that's important to see because we by the time we get over to Matthew chapter 27 and verse 20 we find it says but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus don't be discouraged by people who are claiming to do things in the name of Jesus Christ that they don't belong to. These people, for all the clamor they were creating, were still blinded in their sin. They, they didn't know the Lord. They were, they were caught up in the moment, but it wasn't anything that was genuine. Y'all, there there's a lot that goes on in the name of Christianity in our own country even. And, and it's by people who don't know Christ as Savior. They understand religion, but they don't know Christ. And it's important to keep focused on the Lord Jesus. It's important to keep focused on those who are examples. And it's important to seek to be an example. To those who don't know Christ as well as to those who do and I'm, I'm looking at um, Philippians <clears throat> flip yes Philippians chapter 4 verses 8 and 9 Paul said to the Philippians finally brethren whatever things are true whatever things are honest whatever things are just whatever things are pure whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. And then he says, those things which you've both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Now Paul isn't boasting. He isn't, he isn't trying to focus attention on himself. But what he is doing is pointing out the importance of being exemplary. It's important to do. Now, verse 5 here in our text talks about the person of the prophecy. And Zechariah prophesied, Behold, your king comes to you, meek and sitting upon the, an ass and a colt the foal of an ass. Caesar, the, the, the Roman king, all the line of the, of the rulers, it was pretty much a commonplace. They were brash, there was arrogance, there was boastfulness, aggressiveness. The Lord Jesus is God himself in flesh. He's Creator, and he's going to come presenting himself to his people in, a, in meekness. And remember, meekness 
is the conduct of a humble heart. Jesus is doing so. There are, there are many observations we can make about this, but amongst them, one is that it's the character which he wants to see in his own people demonstrating meekness. And when it says he's sitting upon an ass and a colt the foal of an ass, this also is looking at the idea of the peace that he brings to the hearts of people. Jesus says in John 14 and verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And also, <clears throat> over in John chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus said, These things I've spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Isaiah the prophet said, Isaiah 26, in verse 9, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. There are a lot of people who achieve quietness and calmness in their lives, but they do not have peace. You see, peace comes from God. Peace is not that we have decided that we've got things the way we want it, so everything's cool. The peace that comes through Jesus Christ is what God declares. It's not what I decide. Remember that a lot of times people say they have made peace with God when the real question is, has God made peace with me? That only comes through faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. Over in Romans chapter 5, Paul says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, another thing we want to see out of this text is the response to this offer. In verses 6 and 7, we see the disciples responding. They went, did as Jesus commanded them, brought the ass and the colt, put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. The disciples prepared both animals, both the, the mother and the colt, but in Luke chapter 19, verse 35, we find out that Jesus is the one who rode the colt. This, and it's important to see that because this is an unbroken animal, still has some, some unruly tendencies, and yet he's going to be brought under control by the Lord. Now, as I ponder this text, it strikes me that the disciples were preparing both animals, and yet the Lord Jesus is going to ride the colt because that's what the prophecy says in Zechariah. They were obedient, but they didn't quite have everything in focus. They were just seeking to obey the Lord. Well, that's, that's a lesson for us. On a regular basis, we have scripture portions over which we puzzle. On a regular basis, we will have people who will ask us things that we just don't really have an answer. And when we do have an answer, it seems like it may not satisfy the person. But there are many, many things which we do know, y'all. The things that we know, we're certain they are true from Scripture. We want to hold on to them. We want to obey them. We want to cling to them. We want, we want to make sure we do not let go. And, because, and remember, if somebody comes along and asks us something that we can't answer, 
all in the world that ever proves this that it's something else that we don't know. Well, from my standpoint, what else is new? There are a lot more that I don't know than what I do know. Look at what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The people who are seeking to honor God with their lives are the people who are going to be maligned and ridiculed. It's going on. We've got major factions in our country today who would like to see Christianity eliminated. Paul says in verse 13 of this chapter, but evil men and seducers will become worse and worse, deceiving and be, being deceived. And what does Paul tell Timothy is his solution, his answer to dealing with this? Continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of, knowing of whom you've learned them, and that from a child you've known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. We can tell people that Jesus died for their sin, died for them. We can tell people that if they'll put their faith in Jesus and ask him into their life to save them, admitting their sin, that he will do so. But a lot of people think that's too simplistic. But that's what scripture says. And Paul goes on to tell Timothy, not only thinking to the things you know about what has brought you to faith in Christ, but he also tells Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. There is no other book. The Bible alone is what is going to be our guide, our instruction. There were things that these disciples had to puzzle about, but it didn't keep them from being obedient people. <laughs> had this thought in mind also. The disciples couldn't control this animal like Jesus could. The disciples could not were not the ones who compelled the crowd to shout the praises and give the accolades to the Lord Jesus when he rode into the city. And the disciples certainly weren't going to be able to prevent the crowd when they turned against the Lord a week later and cried out, crucify him. All they could do was be obedient instruments presenting the Lord Jesus. Same for us. We can't force people to believe. We, can't, we cannot prevent people from blaspheming the name of Jesus Christ and dishonoring Almighty God. We can only be instruments to obey and present the Lord Jesus from our lives and our lips. And if someone comes to Christ to be saved, like Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the power may be of God and not of us. When someone comes to Christ to be saved, someone's encouraged, it's because it's by the power of God. Now, not only did the disciples respond, but another thing we see in the response is from the multitude. A very great multitude spread their garments in the way, says in verse 8. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now the garments they were spreading, simply the cloak that they wore over their, their undergarment. <clears throat> For most people, this would be the, the clothing they would have. Wealthier folk would wear more layers. But for most of the people, they had their undergarment, they had their outer garment, the cloak. They didn't have a vast wardrobe, and in many cases, these garments were all that they had to wear. 
They knew what the disciples had done, taking their own clothes and making a seat of sorts on these animals on which the Lord Jesus would sit. So they're responding likewise. As to the branches that they scattered, they're usually palm branches. I found it interesting to learn that sometimes they would toss garlands or roses and it's all depicting a victory celebration. They cry out, Hosanna. This has the sense of save us. The people, at least a good number of them, were expecting Jesus to lead a rebellion and crush Rome's domination, at least in their region. A week later, he's crucified. People can be very fickle. But in fact of the matter, the Lord Jesus did come to save people from their sin. He's going to come someday and rule this earth for a thousand years when, when, he, when he brings in his kingdom. They didn't realize what they were doing. As a matter of fact, remember Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. They didn't. They were crying out, save us, because they wanted to get from out from under the immediate oppression of Rome. But Jesus was going to present a sacrifice of himself to save them from their sin that would be eternal. For those of us who know Christ as Savior, we can be thankful that the Lord Jesus went to the cross. We can be faithful to present our Lord with our lives and our lips. And if somebody is listening to this message and doesn't know Christ as Savior, you may be someone who knows a lot of Bible facts and can even talk theology. But if you've never confessed your sin to God and come in faith knowing that Jesus' sacrifice is the only possible payment for your sin and to have the righteousness that God demands to get into his heaven, you desperately need to do that so you might have a relationship with the living God. If that's your need today, turn to Christ and be saved. Father, thank you for this opportunity to present your word and for the knowledge that your spirit uses it as he sees fit. We need you to minister to us that we might minister to others. Do so for Christ's sake. Amen.